Hello everyone. Um, I'm aware that it is approaching the mocks, so I was asked to come online this evening and speak a little bit about the poet Elizabeth Bishop. Now, just to warn you, I have changed my camera just for this evening, so the quality or the sound might be a little bit unusual, so apologies for that. Okay, um, in a separate post, probably this evening, I'm going to discuss the timing and the length and duration, etc., of your answers, um, how you should approach the paper, all that kind of good stuff, just to prepare yourself for going in. But this evening, right now, is devoted only to the wonderful poet, Elizabeth Bishop. Right, on your mocks um, and your leaving cert indeed, you will study Plath, you will study Bishop, and you will study Elaine Niquilinon, your three female poets. You would be crazy not to know those three female poets inside out. For this evening, I'm going to focus on the American poet, Elizabeth Bishop. Now, for anyone who has studied Bishop, you really should make an effort to understand the background of who Elizabeth Bishop was, because that's the great thing about poetry. It's a window into somebody's mind, into somebody's thoughts and motivations, and it's fantastic because we are so gifted with being able to open the page and read these intimate thoughts and understand what went through somebody's head at a particular time in order to inspire them to write a piece of poetry. Now Elizabeth Bishop um, lost her father when she was only eight months old so she doesn't remember her father. Uh, that left just her and her mum and her mum after a series of hospitalizations was eventually committed to a mental institution and Bishop never saw her mum again after that. So it really was a very traumatic early start to life for Elizabeth Bishop. And that loss of identity and that sense of who she is is something that followed her her entire life. So let's begin. The way I teach Elizabeth Bishop is we cover the three childhood poems first before we move on to the deeper items that feature throughout adulthood. But all the way through, you will notice those moments of awareness and those defining observations that really show Bishop at her finest. OK, what I will need you to do is take out your poetry book. So the one I'm using here is the verse 2019, but any poetry book will do. Um, you're probably working on poetry now um, and any of them are fine. So I'm going to open up Bishop to um, First Death in Nova Scotia. If you open up your books to First Death in Nova Scotia. Okay, so this one here. Okay, so I want you to read it with me and we're going to go through each line. In the cold, cold parlour, my mother laid out Arthur beneath the chromographs. Edward, Prince of Wales, with Princess Alexandra, and King George with Queen Mary. Below them on the table stood a stuffed loon, shot and stuffed by Uncle Arthur, Arthur's father. So in the cold, cold parlour, that sets the atmosphere straight away with that repetition of cold and that long elongated O really sets an ominous undertone to this opening. So your setting is cold, your setting's uncomfortable, there is an element of foreboding here. In the cold, cold parlour, my mother laid out Arthur beneath the chromographs. So a chromograph, if you're not aware, is an old style of photograph. And we have Edward, Prince of Wales, with Princess Alexandra, and King George with Queen Mary. So these would have been the English British royals at the time, um, who would have had rulership over Canada. And as a young child, Bishop would have been fascinated to see these royals up on the walls. And they would have represented, uh, similar to how we would look at the, the royal family today, if you look at Meghan Markle or Kate Middleton, you look at what they're wearing, you look at them with a sense of, oh, look at them. And that's how Elizabeth Bishop, as a young child, looked at the royals. But she was also dodging something. So when you walk into a cold, cold parlour, and you see your mother laying out your little cousin Arthur, that's not somewhere you're going to want to look. So you're going to look all around the room and you're going to fascinate yourself with those pictures of the kings, queens, princes and princesses on the wall. Since Uncle Arthur fired a bullet into him, he hadn't said a word. So the stuffed loon stood on the table. A stuffed loon is a bird that flies over the wetlands and he was shot and he was stuffed by Uncle Arthur, Arthur's father. 
do you think you would say a word after your shot? Maybe not. Do you think you'd say a word after your shot and stuffed? No. But why does Bishop not understand that since he was shot, he hadn't said a word? Because that understanding of death is not there. And there's one of your first moments of awareness. So a moment of awareness is something that's gradually creeping towards an overall epiphany or an overall dawning. Arthur is in his coffin, being laid out by um, Elizabeth Bishop's mother. And on the table, you have a stuffed loon. And since he was shot and stuffed, he hadn't said a word. There's more awareness and more fascination by this silent stuffed loon than there is with her cousin Arthur. He kept his own counsel on his white frozen lake, the marble topped table. Listen to that gorgeous cold imagery. He kept his own counsel. She is personifying the loon to seem like a, a somebody who judges, a judgmental person. He kept his own counsel. He's watching on his white frozen lake, that cold white imagery the marble topped table. Lovely use of metaphor. His breast was deep and white, cold and caressable. The underside of him was deep and white, cold and caressable. There's that repetition of that cold, the cold, cold parlour. His breast was deep and white, cold and caressable. Those hard seas in there. This is an uncomfortable atmosphere and these moments of awareness are gradually increasing until there's a really negative association with the loon. His eyes were red glass, much to be desired. So this loon is making a strong impression on Bishop as a child. He represents white, he's cold, he's devoid of blood, devoid of warmth, he's unnatural, but his eyes are red glass, they're sinister, they're unnatural, they're watching, they're keeping their own counsel on the white marble top table. Come, said my mother, come and say goodbye to your little cousin Arthur. So that shows you just how vulnerable Arthur is as a child to have died and how vulnerable Bishop is that her mum asks her to come and say goodbye to your little cousin, Arthur. I was lifted up and given one lily of the valley to put in Arthur's hand. So that shows you again just how small and vulnerable she is. She had to physically be lifted up to put a lily into Arthur's hand as a marker of respect for the dead. Arthur's coffin was a little frosted cake. Beautiful imagery there, beautiful metaphor. Arthur's coffin, the coffin of a small child, is being compared to a little frosted cake. That's entirely up to your own interpretation, whether you think that because he was a child when he died that it was a white coffin. It may have been that she was so short that she saw the lace and the blanket that's often there on the edges of the coffin and the flowers on top looking like icing. For whatever reason, to her eyes, that was a little frosted cake, taking the sting out of that idea of it encapsulating the body. And the red-eyed loon eyed it from his white frozen lake, again with that moment of awareness. The red-eyed loon from his council table is watching. He's not watching her, he's not watching the royals, he is watching cousin Arthur. And Bishop finds herself watching this exchange between the red-eyed loon and innocent cousin Arthur in his little frosted cake of a coffin. There's a moment of awareness that something is being communicated. There is a sensation here that something is not right. Arthur was very small. It's a very, very strong sentence. Arthur was very small. It's not right that he was dead. It's difficult to explain. He was all white, like a doll that hadn't been painted yet. Beautiful simile there, just to show exactly how pale Arthur had become in death. Again, with the innocence there shown. So you've got the lovely um, frosted cake for the coffin and he is all white. He is drained of blood. He's devoid of life. He is cold. Jack Frost had started to paint him the way he always painted the maple leaf forever. So you have your Canadian flag with the maple leaf and you have the maple leaf forever song. Jack Frost had just started to paint little cousin Arthur 
the way he always painted the Canadian flag. And that's obviously a story that was told to Bishop in order to explain why Arthur would look a little bit different the next time she saw him. Because Jack Frost had come out with his bucket and his brush and when it got really cold, Jack Frost had started to paint everything and he painted little cousin Arthur until he was all white like a doll. He had just begun on his hair, a few red strokes again with that colour creeping in, and then Jack Frost had dropped the brush and left him white forever. So there's a lovely contrast there between the red meaning vibrancy and life and colour and something else. And you have the white, which is coal, devoid of life, frozen. The gracious royal couples, so up in your paintings, were warm in red and ermine. Their feet were well wrapped up in the ladies' ermine trains. There's a sense of solace and comfort coming from these chromographs. The ladies are wrapped in furs. They're red. They're warm. They're everything that life should be. And Arthur is cold in his little frosted cake. They invited Arthur to be the smallest page at court. So just like the Jack Frost story, this is something that was evidently told to Bishop, that you won't see little cousin Arthur after today because he is going to be the smallest page at court. Isn't that wonderful? But how many of you can remember absorbing and accepting the explanations that your parents gave you as a child? There was a time when you didn't question any of those. But eventually, that independent thought began and you began to grow up. This is the exact moment that Bishop loses that childhood naivety and begins independent cognitive reasoning. But how could Arthur go, clutching his tiny lily with his eyes shut up so tight and the roads deep in snow? It's impossible. She understands that Jack Frost has painted Cousin Arthur. She understands that they have invited Arthur to be the smallest page at court. But when she stops and thinks about everything altogether, how is it possible? The roads are deep in snow. He's very small. His eyes are tight and he's holding a lily. It's impossible for him to go. There's your epiphany. An epiphany is a moment of awareness or a gradual realisation that has come about as a result of these gradual moments of awareness. So anywhere that you can see um, Bishop becoming uncomfortable with the contrast between red and white, with the discomfort associated with the loon as he watches everything and observes everything, that creates a growing sensation of discomfort and a gradual realisation that maybe she doesn't understand death just yet. But this, this is what happens when a small child is exposed to the reality that is death. They begin to question everything that they have ever known. And in Bishop's eyes, this is her exact moment that she can recall not accepting what she has been told and thinking of the logic of it herself. It is a stunning poem. It is the first one I always teach. It's the first one that I recommend you answer because you'll notice that everything is taught and everything is spoken about through these lovely observational details. And those observational details, including your metaphors, your similes, your images, your contrast, the personification, they all come together to give you this absolutely outstanding epiphany. That's this realization. And in a small child's life, that realization has the effect of nothing ever being the same again. Okay, so let's move on swiftly. And um, we will move on to filling station. Uh, not filling station, sorry, we'll move on to in the waiting room. So um, many of you may have done this, many of you may not have done this. If you haven't done this in school, I highly, highly recommend that you study in the waiting room. It is a very long poem, I'm aware of that, um, but it has ample opportunity for you to quote in terms of observational details. So what you have here, one, two, three pages, but it's worth it, to be lazy. Okay, so let's read together. Uh, in the waiting room. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist's appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. 
It was winter. It got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown-up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. My aunt was inside what seemed like a long time. And while I waited, I read the National Geographic. I could read and carefully study the photographs. Sorry. The inside of a volcano, black and full of ashes. Then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. Osa and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. A dead man slung on a pole. Long pig, the caption said. Babies with pointed heads, wound round and round with string. Black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire, like the necks of light bulbs. Their breasts were horrifying. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date. It opens up with your setting. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist's appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. There's a real role reversal there because we know that because this is a childhood poem of Bishop's, she is quite young in this. And it seems a little bit unusual for her to be in the waiting room waiting for her aunt to make sure that her aunt kept her dentist appointment. So there's a real sense of a child being a little bit older than maybe she should have been. It was winter, dark setting, little bit of negativity creeping in. It got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown up people. So that shows you how childish she is, how small. Everybody else is grown up people. Arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines, beautiful observational assortment of details. My aunt was inside what seemed like a long time. So because she was a child, that sense of impatience is there. And while I waited, I read the National Geographic. I could read. So the National Geographic, for any of you who have ever seen it, has a very distinctive yellow cover. Um, you'll find it in any half-decent newsagent, but it really isn't a very appropriate reading material for a small child of five, six or seven. Um, they do have a National Geographic Kids out now, but the actual National Geographic is not very suitable. It shows um, very graphic images of different cultures, um, geographical occurrences. It just isn't awfully appropriate reading material. And I carefully studied the photographs. The inside of a volcano, black and full of ashes, such an angry, violent image of this overflowing volcano, black and full of ashes, and then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. There's a real strong sense of a moment of awareness here exploding. Osa and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. So Osa and Martin Johnson were American explorers and they were in the traditional garb of the um, explorers clothing with the long boots and the hard pith helmets. A dead man slung on a pole. Long pig, the caption said. It's a very small child seeing a dead man slung on a pole, not treated with respect, not being buried, but being hauled about on a pole. Babies with pointed heads wound round and round with string. So there are babies in certain cultures and their heads will be wound with string in order to identify them as being part of a, a culture, a culture or a certain part of life. And they're easily identifiable because their heads will take on a certain shape um, because of the, the morphing of the wire, so to speak. Black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire like the necks of light bulbs. So again, um, wire can be twisted around the neck in order to elongate the neck. And it is an aesthetic appearance, but it also makes you instantly identifiable as belonging to a certain culture. Their breasts were horrifying. So this child is seeing babies with heads that look completely different. Women with necks that look completely unnatural. Women who are black, women who are naked, women who have exposed breasts. These are all very, very unusual occurrences for a young child in mainland America. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. So I think we can all understand that. We've all been somewhere where we don't want to draw attention to ourselves, so we busy ourselves doing something. This is exactly what Bishop did, making her instantly relatable. And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date.
So at the end of each stanza, you will notice that she grounds herself by reminding herself of the colour, the date, what she's reading, and all of these work together just to highlight how very, very uncomfortable she's feeling. And let's not gloss over that. She's a small child whose world consists of this waiting room. There's arctics, there's overcoats, there's lamps, there's magazines, there's grown-ups. That's her world. She does not expect to see a volcano exploding with rivulets of fire, dead men slung on poles, black naked women with exposed breasts, babies with heads growing up in a conical fashion. These are not things that she has ever known exists. So this is life changing. Suddenly, from inside came an O of pain and Consuelo's voice. Not very loud or long. I wasn't at all surprised. Even then, I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. So that dislike for her aunt is none too subtle there. Even then, I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. So she's not capable of, you know, tolerating pain. She is very, very silly, even to a small child. And that, oh, of pain coming from the dentist's waiting room. I might have been embarrassed, but wasn't. So this kind of thing obviously happens all the time. But what took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice, in my mouth. Without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt. And not only has this poor child had these enormous moments of awareness by reading the National Geographic, those images and knowledge all became far too much for her until she went, oh, but it wasn't her voice. It was her aunt's voice. It mimicked her aunt's voice and it showed her that as much as she dislikes her aunt, there is a connection between her and her aunt that can't be denied. It's nature versus nurture. Someday you will all turn out like one of your relatives. You will all take on a personality trait or a characteristic, or you will start to look like a relative in age, or you will start to behave like them. It is nature and you can't beat nature. And until now, young Bishop was completely unaware that such a connection existed. And this has further thrown her into this complete whirlwind of awareness. I, we were falling falling, our eyes glued to the cover of the National Geographic, February 1918. So in the previous stanza, you saw that our eyes were glued to the cover, the yellow margins, the date. Now it's not that vague anymore. Now it's the National Geographic. It's February. It's 1918. That feeling of discomfort is increasing all the time. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. Six years old with all of these moments of awareness and her whole life changing, that's unsettling. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round turning world into cold blue black space. All that she knows is this waiting room. This is her world. And for this not to be her world, that's throwing her into blue black space, turning and turning, nothing to hold on to, no foundations, no identity. But I felt you are an I, you have this wonderful identity. But you're an Elizabeth. You're also an Elizabeth. And how many of those are there? You're not just I anymore. You're one of them. Why should you be one too? What makes you part of this chain of people? I scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. I gave a sidelong glance. I couldn't look any higher. At shadowy grey knees, trousers and skirts and boots and different pairs of hands lying under the lamps. I knew that nothing stranger had ever happened, that nothing stranger could ever happen. This is the moment that Bishop's world has changed. She is no longer in this bubble of selfishness, this bubble of this is my world. Now she sees all around her that there are places in the world she has never heard of. There are cultures, people, customs that she has never even thought about. Why should I be my aunt or me or anyone? What similarities, boots, hands, the family voice I felt in my throat, the National Geographic and those awful hanging breasts, held us all together and made us all just one. Bishop is realizing that everybody is individual, but everybody is also intrinsically connected. How? 
I didn't know any word for it. How unlikely. How had I come to be here, like them, and overhear a cry of pain that could have got loud and worse, but hadn't? What is it that makes us all exactly where we are? How did I control that sound in my voice? How am I connected to my aunt? How am I connected to these people? How am I connected to the black women with the naked hanging breasts? How am I connected to all of these when I am a six year old child? The waiting room was bright and too hot. That faintness is coming upon her. Those moments of awareness are washing over and over her. It was sliding beneath a big black wave, another and another. And then it stops. Then I was back in it. The war was on, outside in Worcester, Massachusetts, where night and slush and cold, and it was still the 5th of February, 1918. All of these things have changed, and to Bishop it seems like years must have passed, but it was still night. She was still in the waiting room. It was still the 5th of February, 1918. It was still nighttime and cold and slushy. But everything that she ever knew has changed. And that's your epiphany. And leading up to that all the way are your moments of awareness, gradually unveiling this huge awareness that we are not alone. And we do not have just our own identity. We are connected to everyone around us. We are connected through nature. We are connected through nurture. We are connected through history. And that leads on directly from first death in Nova Scotia, where you saw that awareness of death gradually creeping onto Bishop, exposing her awareness to the fact that death is permanent. Death is a physical thing that stops life. It is a change. It stops Cousin Arthur being able to walk out the door. And now she understands that our identity is not just ours. We are connected to so many people that we might not like, that we mightn't even know. And where does it stop? These are huge thoughts for a six-year-old child. So moving on, um, let us move on to Sestina. And there will be your three childhood poems that you study together. Okay, so for anyone who isn't aware, Sestina is a, a type of poem and how it's written. Um, it must have six stanzas with six lines in each, and the end word must be repeated in some order or another all the way through. So here's your Sestina. Okay, so you can see the layout of those stanzas there. So let's read. September rain falls on the house. Similar to your setting in First Death in Nova Scotia and your setting in In the Waiting Room, you're opening up with a very, very clear setting, time and place in mind. September rain falls on the house. That's a lovely, homely, familiar sound, not unlike now. In the failing light, the old grandmother sits in the kitchen with the child beside the little marvel stove. So the failing light, it's homely, it's night time, it's evening. You've got a grandmother and her granddaughter sitting beside the little marvel stove, which is like an aga where you would open it up and pop coal inside to keep warm. And they're reading the jokes from the almanac. So I know if you actually go into, um, I only saw one recently, at uh, the book centre in Waterford, happened to have an almanac. And when you go in the door on the left hand side, um, an almanac is almost like a journal. And in it are tide times, um, astrology charts, you've got um, jokes, predictions. It's a very unusual, quirky, eclectic little piece of writing. It's beautiful. And they're reading the jokes from the almanac. But the grandmother is laughing and talking to hide her tears. So this gorgeous, homely, lovely setting, it's not real. It's masking something that's not being discussed. They're laughing and talking to hide her tears. She thinks that her equinoctial tears and the rain that beats on the roof of the house were both foretold by the almanac, but only known to a grandmother. So the grandmother believes that her equinoctial tears, so equinoctial is equal times day and equal times night. So she believes that those tears and the rain that beats, it's not falling anymore, it's now beating 
on the roof of the house were both foretold by the almanac. So the almanac knew that these tears and this rain were going to happen. It's personified, it knows this, but only known to a grandmother. So the child has no awareness of these tears. She has no awareness of anything unpleasant. The iron kettle sings on the stove, personified, happy, pretty. She cuts some bread and says to the child, it's time for tea now. But the child is watching the tea kettle's small, hard tears dance like mad on the hot black stove, the way the rain must dance on the house. So the rain is no longer falling, it's no longer beating, it's now dancing on the roof of the house. The tea kettle is not singing on the stove, it's dancing like mad on the hot black stove. Look at that gorgeous imagery, it's so sinister, it's so dark. This child is picking up on the negativity that is not being discussed in this room. Tidying up, the old grandmother hangs up the clever almanac on its string. So again, she's personifying this almanac and hanging it up just above their heads. Bird-like, beautiful simile there. The almanac hovers half open above the child, hovers above the old grandmother and her teacup full of dark brown tears. The almanac has become something sinister. It has fallen open. So if you ever hang anything upside down, it's a bit like that. Bird-like, the almanac hovers half open above the child, hovers above the old grandmother. It's above their heads, sinister, threatening, watchful, not unlike the loon. And the grandmother's teacup full of dark brown tears. Beautiful metaphor there comparing the tears in the teacup to the tea itself. She shivers, picking up on that atmospheric pressure and says she thinks the house feels chilly and puts more wood in the stove. So the stove is representing this comfort, this familiarity, and she keeps going back and back, seeking comfort, seeking solace. It was to be, says the Marvel stove. So the Marvel stove is being personified and a little bit haughty. It was to be. This was it, there was no other way. I know what I know, says the almanac. So between the stove and the almanac, they are both in possession of knowledge, and that knowledge is fate and you can't change fate. With crayons, the child draws a rigid house and a winding pathway. So we're all familiar with houses that children draw. You've got your lovely kind of square box and you've got the chimney smoke and the winding pathway and the sun and the trees over here. Then the child puts in a man with buttons like tears and shows it proudly to the grandmother. So to the child, it was probably natural to put a person in front of the house. And subconsciously, instead of buttons, she gives him little tear-shaped buttons. To her, she has drawn a man. To the grandmother, she has drawn a father, a mother, a missing person. She's aware that there is a loss in her life. But secretly, while the grandmother busies herself about the stove, so again, she's returning to that stove, busying herself while she's discreetly hiding her tears. The little moons fall down like tears from between the pages of the almanac. So beautiful um, imagery happening here, beautiful simile to show that. The little moons fall down like tears from between the pages of the almanac. So in the almanac, you have um, suns, moon, stars, basically, to show your full moons, your half moons, your what the weather predictions are going to be like. So when it's open halfway, the little moons have started to fall out of the little pocket in the almanac and they have fallen into the flower bed the child is carefully placed in front of the house almost like planting seeds time to plant tears says the almanac at that exact moment something changes tears have been planted and then you are reminded what the marvel stove says it was to be i know what i know and you're aware that tears have been planted in this house where things are being unsaid and sorrow is being stifled down and this child will grow up one day. The grandmother sings to the marvellous stove and the child draws another inscrutable house. So similar to what you saw in the waiting room, things move on. These huge changes happen, but at the end, 
time continues on as normal and you're back in the real world. So the child goes back to draw another house and the grandmother sings to the marvellous stove. But something fundamental has changed in the background. Tears have been planted and one day those tears will grow and that child will experience that loss, that awareness and her life will be directed or directly affected as a result. So these moments of awareness all the way through when something is not discussed in a family setting or in any setting, that tension builds and you gradually become aware of it through cold temperatures. You gradually become aware of it by being aware of sinister sounds and the tea kettle dancing like mad, the rain becomes louder, everything changes. Bishop is such a perceptive poet that she notices these observational details and everything becomes important. Okay, I'm only going to do one more, right? Um, the departmental requirement is four. I teach five um, to give you a little bit of an extra leeway and you should answer on five to be fair. Um, and six is often tossed then just in case one or two don't fit. So for those purposes, we're going to move on to filling station. Filling station is written in the um, adult section of Bishop's Life. And it's a, a trait that she got from her father is that she spent most of her adult life exploring and it was a pastime of her father and it's something that was uh, seen to be handed down um, through nature. So um, Bishop was driving across America and she spotted this little filling station or petrol station, a very small um, nondescript type petrol station, absolutely filthy. But she stops the car and she gets out and she has a look. And I love this because to you or I, we would be the first stanza of this and then we would move on. But because Bishop is renowned for her observational details, she doesn't stop. So let's have a look. So filling station. Oh, but it is dirty. This little filling station, oil soaked, oil permeated to a disturbing overall black translucency. Be careful with that match. So she opens with an exclamation, oh, but it's dirty. This little filling station, very unimportant. It's dirty, you wouldn't really go in there. It's oil soaked, it's oil permeated. It's gone through the pores of the place. It's so oily to a disturbing overall black translucency. It's filthy with the oil. Be careful with that match. Then it changes, of course, because it's Bishop. Father wears a dirty, oil-soaked monkey suit that cuts him under the arms. So it's not just the man working there now, it's father. It's taken on a very personal, homely tone. He wears a dirty, of course, oil-soaked, again, of course, monkey suit, so overalls, that cuts him under the arms. So he's probably quite overweight. He might be wearing a, a, overalls that are far too small for him, and they're cutting him under the arms. And several quick and saucy and greasy sons assist him. It's a family filling station, all quite thoroughly dirty. So his sons work there and Bishop has not been told this, but she has looked perhaps at the family resemblances, at the camaraderie and the banter between them all. And she's decided that several quick, so they're quite witty, they're quite fast with their responses. They're saucy, so they might be a little bit, um, a little bit racy with their comments, a little bit naughty and greasy sons, they're all filthy, quite thoroughly dirty. Do they live in the station? So she looks at them and thinks, well, they're all here together. Do they live here? And she looks behind it. It has a cement porch behind the pumps. That's not very petrol station like. And on it, a set of crushed and grease impregnated wicker work. On the wicker sofa, a dirty dog, quite comfy. So crushed and grease impregnated wicker work. Wicker work might be your conservatory furniture, your garden furniture. So there is crushed and grease impregnated wicker work. So somebody has uh, sat on this wicker work so much that it actually has become soaked through with grease. On the sofa is a dog. He's even dirty. So these things have been loved and cuddled and sat on so much that they're actually all grease soaked. Some comic books provide the only note of colour, of certain colour. So we have to assume they're a little bit oily also. 
They lie upon a big, dim doily, draping a tabaret, part of the set, beside a big hirsute begonia. So the tabaret would be a piece of occasional furniture. And the comic books lie upon a big, dim doily. Now, a doily would not be a typical item that you would find in a very oily, dirty petrol station. Neither would a piece of occasional furniture. Beside a big hirsute begonia. So there is a piece of wickerwork furniture, there's doily, there's comic books, there's a piece of occasional furniture, and there's a huge plant, a big hirsute, a hairy begonia. Why the extraneous plant? So Bishop begins to ask a series of rhetorical questions to unveil these moments of awareness, to get to this gradual epiphany that she loves to use. Why the tabaret? Why, oh why the doily? Why are all of these things there? They don't make any sense. Embroidered in daisy stitch with marguerites, I think, and grey or heavy with grey crochet. So they're not just doilies. They're very, very detailed, embroidered doilies that somebody worked very hard on. And there's your moment of awareness. There's your epiphany. Somebody embroidered the doily. Somebody waters the plant, or oils it maybe. Somebody arranges the rows of cans so that they softly say so, 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 so to high strung automobiles. So somebody behind this petrol station has sewn the doilies. Somebody behind the petrol station has watered the plant. Somebody has bought these comic books and arranged everything, but somebody has done something more. Somebody has gone out to the front of the petrol station, gotten the cans of oil that say Esso and amended them and moved them so that the first one says Esso, the second says so, so, so. So that when a high strung automobile shoots past, it says Esso, so, 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 so. And it's almost that zoom sound that a car makes when you go past. And it's aesthetically pleasing to the eyes of the drivers of those high strung automobiles to that beautiful epiphany, somebody loves us all. If there is love here in this oil soaked, oil permeated filling station, there is love everywhere. And you will only realize that if you take the filters off your eyes and look at things properly. It's not just a petrol station, it's a home. This is not just a phone. It is a means for me to stay in contact with those that I love and cherish. It's ways for me to make contact with the world. It's not just a phone. Nothing is as it seems. And only by slowing down in our very, very busy lives can we understand that there is a meaning behind the tiny details in everything that we see. So like all of our other poems, it starts off with that lovely setting and sense of place being established through a series of moments of awareness, unveiled through use of metaphor, simile, strong images, etc. We are gradually brought to this eventual epiphany, which is a moment of awareness where you stop, sit back and go, yes, that's it. And this is Bishop. There is so much more we can talk about, but this is what I would like you to take from this if you are in revision mode before the upcoming mocks. Bishop is a detailed observational poet. She sees the extraordinary in the ordinary and doing that teaches us to look at life in a different way. It teaches us that what we see is not what's there. There is so much more to everything that you see and do, even the people around you. Look around your school classroom. Those who are quiet, that's not who they are. Those who are happy and bouncy and banter, that's not who they are. Everybody has layers, everybody has a story. Try and live as Bishop is advising you to. Look at those observational details, see what others do not see. Anyone has any questions on Bishop as a poet, um, do please feel free to contact me. I'm on Facebook uh, under Tremor Tuition, um, or you can drop me um, um, a comment underneath this and I will come back to you, of course. But if you are revising Bishop, which I strongly advise that you do so, please pay attention to the observational details. Do not attempt to answer her without being able to discuss the poetic techniques. Um, 
Don't try and learn off specific quotes. Try and know the poem. Try and know who Bishop is. Try and understand that she was somebody seeking her identity, struggling through that sense of loss that led to her lifelong battle with alcoholism, quest for identity, soul searching for who she was. And it all started off with that first death in Nova Scotia. All right. Thank you very, very much. Um, I will pop up another video soon after this to discuss the timing and the layout of your paper one and your paper two. Thank you.